Hello everyone, welcome to Botany Beginners. We will be starting in a couple minutes, so hang tight if you're ready to get going. Hello everyone, welcome to Botany Beginners. My name is Paige Schaefer. We will be starting shortly. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. We're going to be starting shortly. Um, we're just gonna wait a couple more minutes for people to hop on. So as you have noticed, you can ask questions through the Q&A and you can also type something in the chat. I have someone monitoring those for me. Also, I have um, breaks in my presentation that I will address questions and or comments as needed. We'll start in a couple minutes.
Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. As I said before, my name is Paige Schaefer. I'm a communications associate at the Tallgrass Prairie Center, and I'm so excited that you're able to join us tonight. Welcome, everyone. This is the first series in our Botany Beginners course. As I said, I'm Paige Schaefer. I'm originally from Eddyville, Iowa, and I have been an AmeriCorps communications associate at the Tallgrass Prairie Center since fall of 2019. I'm so excited to be able to start you on this journey, um, whether it be just studying plants or just enjoying nature wherever you may be. As you've noticed, we have over 400 people attending. That's so amazing. We planned for originally around 20 to 25 people and you guys blew us away with the response of wanting to learn more about plants. Within that 400 people, there's a large diversity in skill levels and goals. So just keep that in mind as you are continuing this course. Some of you might be conservation professionals, um, just hoping to brush up on your skills. Some people, this is your first plant identification class that you've ever taken. And that's okay, this is the perfect place to start. Like I said, we're so excited for you to join us on this journey. So why Botany Beginners? This class was in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Typically at the Tallgrass Prairie Center, we host a course or a training called Botany Boot Camp, where we train our summer AmeriCorps members as well as our student research technicians in how to identify plants. It's typically a very intense boot camp like situation. With social distancing practices put in place, we weren't able to host it this year. So my team and I got together and we said, how can we best serve our friends and other people who just want to learn more about plants? And we came up with Botany Beginners. It is truly a beginner's course, so we will walk you through how to learn to learn plants. Um, that is our main goal. We want to help you learn plants that are the most important to you. That could be a wildflower that you see every day on the trail that you walk your dog on, or it could be getting to know your CRP or your grazing areas on your farm. No matter what plant, we hope that we are able to give you the skills and the ability to identify those plants that are near and dear to your heart. Another goal that we have is we want to increase your appreciation for Iowa's natural areas. As I said before, I'm originally from Eddyville, Iowa, which is down in southeastern Iowa. And prior to my college experience, I never really explored natural areas that extensively. Um, now, I, since I know how to identify plants, I'm able to recognize that cool prairie remnants I see on the roadsides as I'm driving along, or even just appreciate the trails that Iowa has to offer. It's not just corn and soybeans. And after this class, you'll be able to name all those cool wildflowers that you'll be seeing. Also, we want you to be able to connect with other botanists across the state. After this course and during it, you will be considered a botanist. How exciting is that? Um, on our platforms through the website and through Facebook, you're able to chat show your cool plant photos and connect with others from across the state and we even have some joining us from out of state which is also really exciting lastly we want you to feel comfortable using botanical language and field guides i know those terms sound very technical but they're important skills that you need to learn in order to give your plants a name so the overall structure of the course will be like this Typically, we will have a lecture. Right now, you're watching live, which is great, but let's say you have a prior commitment or you're just busy that afternoon. That's fine. The lectures will be recorded and stored on our website and Facebook page. Within each lecture, there will be plants of the day. So no matter the topic, you will be able to say that you've ID'd up to five plants per each lecture. With that, we hope that you start making a plant list of sorts. That plant list can consist of plants that you can identify by sight or have seen while you're out exploring Iowa's natural areas. 
Those we ask that you keep in your field notebook or wherever you would like. You don't have to share them with us, but we would love to see what you're learning about as you continue through this course. Homework and quizzes are optional, but they are great tools for you to practice the skills that you learn through Botany Beginners. Homework and quizzes will not be graded, but I will post the answer key on all platforms roughly a week after they are assigned. If you have further questions or would like to discuss an answer, I ask that you either comment on the Facebook page or email me directly. I'm more than willing to help you understand the answers of these homework and quizzes. As you hopefully already joined, um, the Facebook group. The Facebook group is a place for you to share the cool plants that you are experiencing, your plant lists, ask questions about homework, and connect with other botanists across the state. Virtual field days. Those are virtual tours that will be Facebook Live events that will go explore a remnant prairie, a prairie reconstruction area, a roadside planting, and common conservation practices on farms. And those will be with experts from Practical Farmers of Iowa, as well as experts from the Tallgrass Prairie Center. These will be held in the last couple weeks of July. We have yet to firm up those dates, but once we know, you will know as well. Lastly, Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is the recommended guide for this course. I understand that many of you have questions of why we chose this guide. It's a really good beginner's guide. Um, it walks you through step by step and doesn't use a lot of jargony language that typically guides are grouped by. Another thing to point out is Iowa isn't listed in the map of plants covered, but it does a great job of covering anywhere from prairie plants to wetland plants to common weeds that you might see growing in your backyard. Another thing I would like to point out is that a good botanist has always more than one guide. For instance, I have a guide that's specifically on prairie plants. We are happy to share those resources with you, but we just didn't want to overwhelm you with saying you had to buy seven different guides when you first started botanizing. This is a great starter guide and a great guide to learn how to use a field guide in. And another thing to point out is that Iowa doesn't have one guide that covers all the vegetation that could possibly happen in Iowa. So if you're really, really excited about botany, I charge you to hopefully create one of those. I know I would use it in my daily life, um, but right now there isn't one out there that exists. So the Botany Beginner Schedule. This is located on our website and our Facebook page. There's also printable versions of this on the website if you want to print them off and have them hanging. Um, as you can see, right now we're doing lesson one. Lesson two will be this Thursday. And then typically after that, the lectures will be on Wednesday nights. On the schedule as well is when homework are due and assigned so that way you have a general sense of when to complete your homework and quizzes if you wish to participate that way. As I said before, the virtual field tours will happen in the last two weeks of July. We just haven't been able to schedule those yet. So stay tuned for those dates. So now we are discussing the topics. As you know, I'm Paige Schaefer. I'm doing the introduction. Laura Jackson will do botany fundamentals and how to use a field guide. Laura Fisher-Walter will round out the fundamentals with tricks to becoming an expert botanist. Justin Meissen and Christine Nemec will teach you how to identify CRP and roadside plants. Laura Fisher-Walter and Justin will then go into remnant prairie plant identification and then I will end the course with continuing your botanical journey. As you see we start pretty specific. I will cover a lot of terms and the overall layout of the class and we'll slowly build up to really flexing your plant ID skills. So now we are getting into my portion of the lecture. So if I would recommend taking notes if that's something you're interested in but we are going to build our botany toolkit. Botany and plant identification is a lot like building a house. You can't have 
um, you can't put up a roof or you can't put up walls without having the materials and the tools. So it's really, really important that we have these skills ready to go before we start using a field guide and going out and identifying plants. So what do you need to know in order to know your plants? You need to know how to safely explore natural areas. You need to know the difference between scientific and common names. You need to know some basic plant and botany terminology, and you need to know how to photograph plants. Safety. So when I go out and I'm getting ready to explore a natural area, I like to make a plan before I go. That plan can be Googling and finding out um, a trail map. It can be planning with a friend to say, we're gonna meet and go hiking from eight to 10. It can be checking the weather. It is good to make a plan and I would also make sure that you go with a buddy or a partner or a friend just so there's safety in numbers. I do still recommend social distancing though. Another important thing is to hydrate, especially during Iowa's hot summers. It is important that you carry water with you as well as consume a lot of water while you're out exploring. Safety gear. So I would recommend if you're going to go walking through a prairie or a brushy area, wearing long pants so your legs don't get scratched up, as well as either copious amounts of sunscreen or a long sleeve shirt. Oftentimes I like to wear a hat and bring a backpack so that I can hold my field notebook and field guides, as well as I sometimes like to wear safety glasses or sunglasses if it's bright outside. No, you do not need a hard hat. This is a photo from me when I worked um, as a field technician for the Forest Service in Northern Wisconsin. I'm sure my parents would still like me to wear a hard hat everywhere I go, but it's not needed for you. Lastly, in terms of safety is that plants can be dangerous. Um, whether that be poison ivy, wild parsnip, there are plants that if you brush up against them, you will break out in a rash and that's okay. You just need to be able to know how to give those a name and avoid them. So that's what we're going to be covering in this class is how to give plants a name so you can avoid the contact with the dangerous ones and appreciate the beautiful ones. Um, another thing to point out is if that if you don't know it, please don't eat it. I'm not um, a herbalist or a forager by any means. If you are, that's great. I would just make sure you confirm your ID with a trusted source before you consume it. So that brings us to our first plant of the day, which is poison ivy. Yay, everyone's favorite, right? No, wrong. Um, so poison ivy's scientific name is Toxicodendron radicans. It's a part of the sumac family, which can be confusing because sometimes you hear that poison sumac's in Iowa when actually it's not found in Iowa. It's a perennial, which means it comes back year after year after year. Um, the best way to remove poison ivy is to completely dig it out. If you leave some of the roots, it will sprout again next spring, which is frustrating. But yep, yeah, that's what perennial means. It's found in woodlands and fence rows and basically any brushy or disturbed area. So as you know, a rash will develop if you come into contact with this plant. The tricky part about this plant is it can be both a shrub and a vine. So you can see them growing as short little shrubs or you can see them climbing on trees. I would just point out that my main way for identifying poison ivy is the obvious saying of leaves of three, which this is actually all one leaf and these little three leaves are actually considered leaflets. We'll go into that terminology later, but as you can see, if you look on the edge, you'll see that they're irregularly like notched or indented. Typically plants are very structurally similar to each other. They don't have that irregularity, um, but poison ivy does. So that's my main way of telling poison ivy from another plant that has a leaf of three. Also, you can see on this one, it's a vine, but see how deeply lobed some of these are and some of them are not? That's a good example of the irregularity you could see amongst poison ivy. Another key identifier is if you leave it alone, if let's say you think it's poison ivy so you avoid it um, and you come back in the fall or like late summer, it'll start turning red and then it'll eventually turn like a red, like a deep red. 
So if it changes color as the season progresses, it's definitely poison ivy. Plant names. So there's two different ways to name plants. The first one is the common name, and it often originates from descriptions and it's re regionally variable. So for instance, this plant that we have pictured, I would call bluebells or Virginia bluebells, while my friend from Missouri, she might call it um, Virginia cowslip, which when talking to each other, we could totally like not realize that we're talking about the same plant. So that's one thing to keep in mind with common names. Common names are often really descriptive. So Virginia cowslip actually comes from when you touch these leaves, they feel like a cowslip apparently. I don't know, I don't know about that, but that's what people in Missouri call them, I guess. Um, if you want to make sure that you're universally talking about the same plant, it is important that you use the scientific name. The scientific name is Latin nomenclature and it refers to the genus and species that that plant belongs to. And it typically does not change once it is named unless there is a discovery within its genetics or something like that. So that brings us to our next plant of the day, which is Virginia bluebells or Mertesna virginica. It's a part of the borage family. It's a perennial, which means it comes back year after year. It's a spring ephemeral, which means it blooms really, really early in the spring. Um, so that way it has access to pollinators. And then it's um, is just vegetative the rest of the summer and fall. It's found in woodlands and meadows. And oftentimes, I know it's becoming pop popular for people to dig these up and put them in your yard. I do not condone that, but I appreciate you appreciating the native plants. Um, comment in the chat if you have seen this before, a simple yes or no, and I will check that. Awesome, so a lot of you have seen this before. This is a really common plant, especially when I go hiking through a lot of Iowa's forests and woodlands. So botanical terms, this can seem really, really daunting. Um, botanical terms are a way for botanists to talk to other botanists and have no one else know what they're talking about is what my professor once told me. Um, we will be covering the basic terms that we are used in Newcomb's wildflower guide. Um, an important thing to know is let's say I'm talking really fast and you aren't able to write down the notes or you missed a slide. There is a glossary in the very first couple pages of Newcomb's that break down all the vocab that we are covering. So let's say you start keying something out and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't remember that. That's okay, they have a glossary for you. Um, also, there's a lot of terms out there. We're only gonna cover the basic ones that Newcomb's covers, um, but there will be a resource guide that I will post that'll have additional resources if you're really into botany terminology. Also, we asked you guys to participate in a pre-survey quiz just to let us know your um, abilities and stuff. Right now, no one is an expert. Zero out, of, zero out of almost 200 people. So there you go. We're all going to learn. I'm an amateur botanist. You guys are just going to learn botanical terminology. It's going to be okay. This is a safe place for you to practice and learn. So I'm going to take you back to high school biology. Um, with flowering plant anatomy. This is really important because how we identify plants is talking about the different structures and the different characteristics on each of those structures. So we will start from the bottom up. We have the roots, which we can have a tap root, which I like to think of a good example of a good tap root would be like a carrot or a turnip. Um, and then we have lateral roots. Typically, the root system isn't used in IDing plants. And if it is, we don't want you to dig up the plant and like bring it home with you to ID. A simple photograph will do the trick. Um, next we have the shoot system, which is everything that's above ground. This is really key in identifying plants. So we will start from the bottom up. As I said, we have the stem, which is the predominant middle section of the plant. From there, we have a leaf, which many of you probably know, but it consists of a blade and then a petiole. 
And where the petiole attaches to the stem is a node. I like to think of the node as like an elbow or an armpit. Um, and that space in between the nodes is called an internode. So if we have a vegetative shoot, that means that there's no flower or reproductive shoot or part on it. If there is a flower present, it's considered a reproductive shoot. Lastly, buds or immature flowers are located in different parts sometimes on the stem or petiole. So if we have a terminal bud, I like to think of that as towards the end of the vegetative shoot or the reproductive shoot. And I like to think of an airport. So an airport, the terminal is the last place that you're going before you board the plane. So terminal far away from the stem. Axillary, that means it's within the axis or very close to the node of the plant. So right in the elbow or armpit of that um, branching section. So these are all terms that will be used in the book to describe, let's say it has no petioles or it has a hairy stem. So those are important things to know when IDing plants. Next, we have leaf arrangements. As I said before, leaves consist of a petiole and a blade. So a simple leaf is just a one leaf or one blade per one petiole. And there's a lot of different ways that those can be arranged on a stem or stalk. So first we have alternate, which means the attachment points are different. I like to think of when I used to climb um, monkey bars or climb a ladder, you do one hand and then the other. Um, as you can see here, the attachment points are different. They're alternating. Opposite is when the attachment points are the same. I like to think of this as like being a stick figure. Your arms typically attach in the same, on your body in the same location, opposite. The difference between opposite and world are, is world goes around in a circle all the way up the stem or stalk. Opposite just goes right or left, not in a circle. The difference between world and basal is basal is at the very bottom where the stem connects to the roots. Therefore, that's the only location where leaves are. Sometimes basil leaves trick you into thinking there's no leaves at all. So you have to spread out the other stuff that's growing nearby it to really get a good look at the basil leaves. Sometimes there won't be any leaves and that's okay, but we typically there are always some type of vegetative leaf there. So we talked about the simple leaf arrangements and now we're talking about the compound leaf arrangements. So simple, like I said, one um, blade per one petiole. If it is pinnately compound, I like to think of like a feather or a pinna is the word to describe a feather. Um, and it branches at the same point. It is considered opposite. So they all have similar attachment points. And this one right here is what we would call oddly pinnate, which means there's an odd number of leaflets per this one big leaf. If it were evenly pinnate, it has an even amount of leaflets per one pinnate. We have palmate, which is, I like to think of palm, like the palm of your hand. Um, it all have one center connecting point. So similar to like your hand, you have your palm and all your fingers come from that. And that's the same with this leaf arrangement. You have one connection point where all the leaflets attach. Then, to be more confusing, you can have something that's doubly pinnate or doubly compound. That is where instead of having one single leaflet, we have another branch of a whole bunch of leaflets attached. So you could have double or even triple pinnate. That brings us to our next plant of the day, um, which is wild blue phlox or phlox divaricata. It is a perennial. It's also found in woodlands, near streams. It really likes to keep its feet wet. Um, an important thing that I would point out when IDing this plant is you can see it has almost an arrow-shaped or an oblong leaf 
and we just learned about leaf arrangements. So I would like you to put in the chat, what leaf arrangement do you think this is? Do you think it is opposite? Do you think it is alternate? Or do you think it is world? So just comment those and I will look to see what is going on. Yes, yeah, so most of you are right. It is opposite. It is opposite because they have one con like common connecting point. If it were alternate, this leaf would be connected up here. Good job, everyone. You passed your first quiz of the day. So leaf shape. There's a lot of different ways for leaves to be characterized within their shape. Newcombs breaks it down into four or five main categories. We have entire, which means that the leaf has no indentions on the side of the leaf. We have toothed, which means that there's some kind of indention, it's very slight. We have lobed, where it is slightly more indented, not quite to the midrib or the middle of the leaf. We have lobed at the base, which means it's only indented um, slightly at the base. And then we have divided leaves, which I like to consider some of those might be compound leaves that we just learned about. So within that, there's also other ways to characterize leaf shape. For example, we have narrow, oblong, elliptical. What I like to think about when um, characterizing leaf shape is what does it look like or what can we compare it to that you know in real life? For example, if it looks like an egg, it's egg-shaped. If it looks like a heart, an arrow, lance-shaped and narrow are the really only two ones that are a little bit different. But it is important to consider that leaf shape can be impacted by environmental stressors or other things can change the leaf shape. So when you're looking at a plant and you look at the leaf, let's say a caterpillar munched a hole in it. That will not be like depicted within the field guide at all. And I would ask that you look at a different leaf. Let's say the leaf is growing next to your shed or your barn and it's a lot smaller than the rest of them and almost has a little bit of a funny color. Um, once again, when looking at plants, you wanna make sure that you're looking at the parts of the plant that best describe the plant. Granted, for example, when you were two, you looked really different than you do right now. Um, and that's another key component to think about when IDing a plant. How old is it? Does it have a flower? Um, and if you aren't able to answer those questions or don't know, what I would recommend is taking a picture of it and then maybe visiting it next time you go to that trail or natural area to see if it's changed at all since you last saw it. So that brings us to our next plant of the day, which is giant ragweed or ambrosia trifida. It's a part of the aster family. It's a summer annual, which means every year it goes to seed and grows a completely new individual. It loves disturbed areas and edges. So I see a lot of um, giant ragweed in my dad's, near my dad's like our sweet, corn patches um, right when he plows them. Sometimes he doesn't pick up the discs soon enough and so there'll be a perfect area all treated and ready for giant ragweed to come in. Another thing to think about is how would you characterize this leaf shape? So we just learned entire, toothed, lobed, and divided. So out of those four, what would you consider this leaf shape to be? Keep in mind, it could be a combination of two, but just take your best guess. All right, so it is lobed. That is the first characteristic of it. It oftentimes has three to five lobes that are really key in identifying this plant. As you can see on this leaf over here, it only has three, but it typically ranges from three to five. 
Also on some of these, you can notice a slight um, serration or a slight indention. So it is, the correct answer would be, it is lobed and it is slightly toothed. Um, an important thing to note is that it can have those combinations and it is totally a judgment call on what you think is best describing of the plant. Another key characteristic of giant ragweed is how tall it gets. So this plant can get up to three to five feet tall. So it grows pretty quickly and extensively within that roughly year that it is alive. As you can see here, this is its flower structure. Um, and what, we'll talk about flower structure a little bit later, but this is a whole bunch of flowers, probably a hundred or so flowers, all smashed on one stalk. And one thing that's important when you see this is there's no petals or nothing to really attract insects, which means it's wind pollinated. So if you have allergies, this probably won't be your favorite weed that you see driving down the road. Um, so yeah, those are the key characteristics of giant ragweed, which is a common weed that you see on disturbed edges and areas. So leaf margins and venation. So toothed and lobe are two great examples of leaf margins. When I say leaf margins, I mean the very edge of the leaf. So these are all terms that are in the glossary of Newcomb's Guide. I just wanted to be able to show you and share with you the names of what these mean. You don't have to memorize them all by tonight and have them ready to go for your homework. I just like to connect with them visually. For me, I have to make like a little story in my head in order to remind, like to remember. Um, so entire, once again, there's no indentation. Serrate, I like to think of like a serrated steak knife. Undulate um, reminds me of waves slightly. Simulate, I like to think of a cloud. Um, Crenate, when I was little, I used to like doodle in a circle and that's what it looks like to me. Crenulate is when I think of like a crimper. And granted, things can be double serrate or double dentate or lobed, but these are all just terms that you might come across that I just want you to visually see and hopefully connect with, but you don't have to know them all right away. There is a glossary for that. Venation might also be mentioned in the plant description when you're keying out a plant. And this is just how the veins are arranged on the leaf. So some of these words we've already heard before. So for example, pinnate, we've heard that before. That's a leaf arrangement that we covered. Palmate, another leaf arrangement that we covered. Parallel is where the lines don't intersect. Dichotomous, I like to think of a dichotomous key um, where they are long and then slowly branch more and more and more. Arcutate, it means these veins arc up to the very point to the leaf. Cross venulate, there's a lot of little indentations between the margins or the leaf um, veins. Rotate, I like to think of like, it reminds me of a rosette or a flower. And reticulate is very, very random amongst its veining. Like I said before, you don't have to memorize these in order to be able to identify plants. It's just good to have seen them before, so that way you're able to say, oh, I've seen that before on that, on that slideshow that Paige gave. Um, I'm able to look that up in the glossary so I can give a name to that description. Some other miscellaneous plant terms that we haven't covered yet that could be important. So we have the midrib, which I referred to a couple times previously, but that is just the dominant middle vein of a leaf. A margin is the very edge of the leaf and the petiole is where it is attached. So a stipule is just a small vegetative structure that sometimes attaches to the petiole. It often looks like little wings to me and the presence or absence of that is key in identifying um, different plants. Also, leaves like to attach to plants in different ways. So it could be sessil, which means there's no petiole at all. Um, and another version of a sessile leaf is a clasping, a clasping base, excuse me. And that reminds me of a chip clip. So it's literally clipping right on to that stem or stalk, um, holding on that way. It almost looks like the leaf is like 
the stem is going straight through the leaf. Another important feature that you might come across is tendril, which I like to think of like your garden peas, if you've ever seen those growing before. It's a small vegetative structure that's often at the terminal or the end of leaves or leaflets, and they allow plants to hold on and prop themselves up if they're climbing. So botany break, how are we doing? How are we feeling? I will answer some questions right now. So the first question is, is everyone allergic to poison ivy? So that's a tricky question. I would preface this by saying I am not a doctor, um, but people do have differing levels of reaction. Some people, it takes a lot of time um, a lot of built up exposure in order for you to develop a rash. For instance, I don't react that severely. I have to roll around in it pretty good to get a rash. Whereas I have a friend that if someone's burning poison ivy, like in a fire or something, he has a reaction severely. So I would say if you don't know already, then you don't react that severely because probably you've come in contact with it at one point or another. Which scientific name do current botanists use, the old Linnaeus or the new DNA-based nomenclature? So this is an interesting question. Um, a lot of the field guides are based off Linnaeus and some the old stuff, but as we learn more and more about plants, they are being renamed and recategorized amongst um, their scientific namings. So scientific names sometimes change, but that would mean that either the whole genus is being moved to a different name or just separated within itself, if that makes sense. Can a plant have multiple types of leaves? Example, basil and alternate. So it, it could have different leaves such as it could be alternate and um, have like a different leaf margin, but you can't be like alternate and opposite. For example, because the attachment points are different, you could be world, but only at the base, which would then be basal. So yes and no, but most of the time, it's usually only one common leaf structure. Um, I'm allergic to both poison ivy and mangoes. Cashews are also in this family. Yes, so they are a family of plants that have the oil of like the urosol oil, I believe it's called. Um, so yes, that typically plants in those families all have the same common oil. Are poison oak and poison ivy similar? Good question. Poison oak looks like an oak leaf. So as I mentioned, poison ivy has irregular indentations on the sides of leaves. Poison oak has more of a lobe structure, so it will look more like this. What is the difference between undulate and sinuate? So undulate is a very, very slight wave in the leaf margin. Sinuate is just slightly deeper. Granted, in Newcomb's guide, they don't use these two terms, they just say, a slight like indention or it's slightly toothed for instance even though when I think of tooth I think of like jagging in um, but for our intensive purposes you don't need to know the difference really between these two and I'll take a couple more questions and then we'll move on um, What kind of leaves does a spiderwort plant have? So for instance, I would say they are one parallel. They have parallel venation and they're entire. So you can't really tell, but there's no um, edge like or tooth on this plant. And I believe it might be alternate, but don't quote me on that. This isn't a really good picture of a spiderwort plant. Um, it doesn't capture the leaves, so I'm not able to 100% tell you with all accuracy. Um, one more question, then we'll get going. 
who oversees the rules in botanical terminology? Um, a lot of people from a lot across the world get together. Um, scientists, experienced botanists who have published mostly genetic or phylogenetic research that do either the DNA sequencing of these plants of the major families and they get together and decide. Um, similar, they don't really phone a friend and call the people at the Tallgrass Prairie Center to cast in their votes or anything by any means. It's definitely um, people who have published a lot of genetic research determining the name changes. And they don't like to change names because then you have to change a lot of field guides and a lot of field guides become inaccurate then. Okay, we're going to move on. I will, um, if you have questions, please keep posting them. I will respond to most of the questions if we have time at the end. Also, if we don't have enough time at the end, then um, I will either email you or post it on Facebook. So now we're gonna go back to high school botany or high school biology and go back into flower anatomy. So many of you have probably seen a diagram like this before and there's four main components of this plant. So we have the female structure, which is the carpal, the male structure, which is the stamen. We have the petals and then we have this like the supporting organs which are the receptacle, sepals, and peduncle. So we will start with first the female reproductive structure. So the female reproductive structure consists of the stigma, the style, the ovary, and ovule. Typically, you won't be able to see the ovary and ovule. Totally fine, you don't really need those for identification purposes. The stigma and style are really important for IDing because sometimes the stigma is really pronounced or like the style is really long and that will be noted in your um, field guide. The stigma is oftentimes sticky. So for pollination to happen, uh, insect or something comes along and gets pollen from the male structure up here and then visits the stigma and then deposits the pollen there and starts the reproductive process. The male portion of the flower is consists can um, put together by the anther and the filament. The anther, like I said, that's where pollen is stored and created. Um, and the filament is just the structure that holds it up. An important thing to note here, this is considered a perfect flower, meaning it has both the male and female parts present. Um, some flowers, you'll notice that they only have the male parts or they only have the female female parts, or they'll be missing some of these structures. And that's okay. It doesn't mean your plant is sick by any means. Plants have different strategies for reproducing. Um, moving on to the petals. So the petals are oftentimes colored depending on how pollination occurs. For example, when we talked about giant ragweed, it didn't have any petals because it was wind pollinated. It wasn't trying to attract any um, plant or excuse me any pollinator so why invest in creating that structure when you don't need it so an interesting fact or a name is a petal a, a single petal is called a petal but multiple petals is called a corolla so oftentimes typically not in the newcomb's guide that we're using but if you see that word that's what it means it's just multiple petals um, the receptacle is the portion of the um, flower that holds the flower structure up and the peduncle is how the flower attaches to the stem or stalk. That's one of my favorite words in botany. I don't know, it's just fun to say. So sepals, so when you look at a bud, you're looking at the sepals. They're oftentimes a protective covering. Um, they're green typically and then once the flower blooms, they just are hanging out below the flower. All in all, it's really important to make sure we know where these structures are at and what their names are when it comes to identifying because like I said, the presence or absence and or the changes within these parts are important in IDing flowering plants. So that brings us to our last plant of the day, which is the shooting star or Dodecathion media. Um, it's a part of the primrose family. It's a perennial 
It's found in prairies, open woodlands, bluff edges. This is one of the new prairie plants that I found um, when I started working at the Tallgrass Prairie Center. I didn't have much exposure to prairie plants, and so I saw this plant and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting looking. It looks like, people say it looks like a shooting star. I think it personally looks like a bird, um, but that's just me. Um, it's really unique in its flower structure. As you can see, the petals are pushed back. Um, it's not like a typical rosette where the petals are just staying um, kind of open. And the stamen right here is actually a cone shaped, which is also unique. That's a good example of how different structures of flower organs can come together and help you identify plants. Another important thing to know is we learned about leaf arrangement, and this is a good example of a basal leaf arrangement. When I was walking out at the prairie, I, when I first saw this plant, I thought, oh my gosh, it has no leaves. That's so weird. And then I was able to get down on my hands and knees and spread apart the grasses and stuff that were nearby it and see that it actually had a basal um, formation down there, which is really cool. Also, this is spring flowering. So right now, shooting stars are just wrapping up. I went to a remnant prairie last week where I got the, some of these photos. Um, so you might be able to go see them if you go out right now. Um, they could just be ending on their flowering and going into the fruiting part of their life. Flower arrangements. So flowers can be arranged in multiple different ways like just how leaves can be arranged in multiple, oh my goodness, I accidentally clicked. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so flowers can be arranged in multiple different ways. First off, we have the racine, which is where the plants are, alter um, the flowers are alternating on one single stalk. As you can see, the peduncles are attached um, to the flower and they're alternating. This is different than the spike which a spike is just flower directly on the stem or stalk. There's no peduncle, there's no attachment um, to that. It's just directly flower, stem, and stalk. A chyme is alternate and it also creates this flat curve. So as you can see, no matter where it is attached, it tries to make a, I like to think of it as like a landing pad for insects to come on. Um, and that's different than a corm because a corm is opposite. As you can see, it has only one um, attachment point and it's convex. So that means it just dips in the middle a little bit. As you can see, it then continues on to be also opposite even in its further attachments. A panicle is like a raceme, so very similar to this but there's multiple um, branches per um, peduncle. There's, instead of just having one flower, they have multiple. So that's a definite, like a definite characteristic of that. And the last one is an umbel, which is one of my favorites. Um, I like to think of this as like an upside down umbrella. So like if you're in a storm and your umbrella flips up, that is what I think it looks like. So it has one attachment point. So I like to think of this one as almost palmate because all of the plants are being attached to one location and all like still coming up and making like almost a landing pad. And that's different than chyme because chyme is alternating. So I noticed when I was looking through some of your responses to um, the survey that some of you would like some grass ID. While this is a beginning course, I would just throw that out there. So we are going to cover some grass and grasses and grass anatomy, but I would have you explore this on your own. Um, a lot of this gets a lot, very, very complex very quickly. And oftentimes you do need a hand lens and to be able to be comfortable identifying all these structures. I believe there's a question, so I'm gonna look at that real quick and then we'll get into grass anatomy. Um, what? Okay. So is the carpal the same thing as a pistol in reference to newcombs? Yes, so those two terms are synonymous with each other. Um, just botanists using different terms and different terminology, but yes, those are synonymous. 
What about the pistol? So I will go back to the flowers. So carpels, yeah, so what about pistol? So pistol and carpel are the same thing. It's just a different word that describes it. Um, I believe in Newcombs it uses the term carpel, um, but if you ever see pistol in a different guide, that is what it, that is. All right, so we're gonna start doing a brief introduction to grass anatomy. I'm not going to go into this um, very deeply just because it can get really confusing and we've already talked about a lot of terms today. Um, so I just want to be respectful of your time and make sure that we end this um, webinar on time. So the important thing to know about grasses is their inflorescence. Um, a lot of the times you do need to see that in order to identify it. It's also called a spike. There's different um, arrangements within that. I'm not going to get into that, but there's typically an on, a racula, and a gloom. And all of this put together makes up a spikelet. Um, a collar or like the collar region is really important as well. So we have the blade, which I think of like a typical blade of grass, which is considered like the leaf. Um, and the collar is just where that leaf blade attaches to the sheath, which the sheath is where the blade continues onto the stem, almost like it's wearing a coat. And that collar region is oftentimes where we'll find the ligule, which has different defining characteristics of grasses. Another thing to point out is grasses have a unique way of growing where they have a low meristem or a low place where they can continually reproduce and or grow. So that's why when you're mowing or your animals are grazing on an area, as soon as you mow it, the plants don't die because they have this area where they're continually putting up new leaves and new growth because this meristem is still intact. So that's just a fun fact that I never realized when I'm out mowing my lawn that I'm not killing the grass, I'm basically giving it a haircut or I'm pruning it. Whereas if I were to do that with woodland plants, they would automatically die. Photographing plants. So photographing plants is really important in the identification process. I would say if you can bring your field guide with you when you go out and explore or are trying to go out and botanize. Field guides are meant to be used. Um, I have a couple of field guides that are hanging on by the seat of their pants. They got duct tape all over them. They've been left in the car or left out in the rain. Um, they've been well loved and that's the, I guess, a defining characteristic of a good field guide is when you're able to use it, go out in the field and find the plants and able to really put it to use. Because if it's just sitting on your coffee table, um, it's really not helping you that much. But photographs are a great way for you to capture um, all these parts that we talked about and how to see those later when it's not 90 degrees and you're sweating like crazy. So remember to make sure you have all the defining characteristics in the photo, not just the flowers. So this was a mistake that I made early on in my botany career. This is actually my photo of one of the first times I was a field tech in northern Wisconsin. I was identifying plants and I saw this aster and I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. I'll just take a picture and key it out later. So I took a picture of it and I get back to the office and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited I get to key it out. And then the first question it asked, what did the leaves look like? And I was like, well, I have this really cool photo, um, but I can't see the leaves. So I asked my boss and she's like, yeah, you can't really tell what it is because you don't see the leaves. So even though this is a really cool photo, um, share it with your friends and family, but for identification purposes, it's really not helping you out much. For example, I took this photo um, a couple days ago when I went out for a walk at work, and this was a type of milkweed. It hasn't flowered yet, so I can't totally identify it, but I can rule some of the species out based on the leaf arrangement, the leaf margins. I can see where the flower would be. Also, I think it's important that you take pictures from different angles as well. Not just top down, not just the flower. Be sure to try to capture all of it.
also make sure your plants are in focus. Um, another thing that I get a lot of, I love my family, but they'll send me these blurry photos or like their fingers in the way and they're like, what's this plant? And I'm like, I'm not able to help you. I'm really, really sorry. So Chris Helzer, um, he is a blogger of the Prairie Ecologist, put together a roadside wildflower guide at full speed. So it shows photos like this um, and has the identification of them. So I would just say if on your homework or when you're posting to the Facebook group, be sure to make sure that your photos are in focus. There's no shadows. Also an important characteristic is the general location. Sometimes when I'm trying to identify a plant, I take a picture of it and then I kind of stand up and take a picture of the surrounding area. So that way I remember exactly where I'm at. Even though let's say I could be at Walter's Prairie, am I by the more wet part? part of Walter's Prairie or am I by the entrance where it's a little bit drier. So those things are also important when you're working to identify your plants. So what have we learned so far? We've covered the structure of the Botany Beginners course. We've covered how to be safe while botanizing. We've covered scientific names versus common names. We've went into great detail about botany terminology. So we talked about flower, flower, plant, and grass anatomy. We talked about leaf descriptions and arrangements. We've talked about floral and fluorescence. And we've also learned five, five plants today, which is great. We've learned how to identify poison ivy, how to identify Virginia bluebells, how to identify giant ragweed, shooting star, and wild blue phylox. So a final note, um, as I was getting ready for this lecture, um, my boss asked me if I read the foreword to Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. And I was like, no, I only used it um, for the, like, the keying out purposes. I didn't read the guide at all. Um, and she goes, you should read it. So I'm going to read you a brief passage from this foreword. The reminder, this book was written in the early 1970s um, and it's still around to this day. So without further ado, this is the foreword that was written by Roland Clement, who at that time was the vice president of the, Nat the National Audubon Society. He says, finally, your enjoyment of wildflowers and other plants should make an important contribution to your feeling at home on this planet. We are growing increasingly aware that our ability to function well as individuals and as members of social groups depends to a large extent on our sense of belonging. At a time when social changes are bewilderingly rapid and uncertain, familiarity with the natural environment, especially when enhanced by field work with plants, provides a valuable anchor in reality. So I just thought that was a good closing to this to today's lecture um, because even though we just learned a lot of terms, I think it's important that you know that this is a step in creating belonging within your um, location and your natural areas around you. By giving plants a name, you're able to do that and you're able to say, I know these plants by name and I hopefully feel more at home in this landscape. So this course would not be possible without the following partners. So I would first like to thank the Tallgrass Prairie Center and all the staff that have devoted a lot of time and effort to putting these um, lectures together, as well as supporting me in the creation of this project. I would like to thank Practical Farmers of Iowa, as well as Green Iowa AmeriCorps, and as well as the University of Northern Iowa. Up next, so coming this Thursday, Laura Jackson, who is the director of the Tallgrass Prairie Center and a biology professor at the University of Northern Iowa, will be going over more botany fundamentals as well as diving into how to use the field guides. Also, um, if you haven't yet, that's a good time to purchase Newcomb's Guide. It's not um, required by any means, but if you would like to follow along on that lecture, it is important that you have it. Are there any questions? I will now take questions from the group. Alrighty. Poison. 
So poison ivy can have larger stalks as it climbs on trees. Typically it doesn't though. One thing I would point out is that with poison ivy, even if it doesn't have leaves and you see this branch um, winding around the tree, don't touch the branch because it can still have some of that oil that creates a reaction amongst people. Um, why is skunk cabbage colored the way it is? It is an early plant. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I will talk with my coworkers and get back to you on that. How do you eradicate giant ragweed? Also another great question. Since it is an annual, um, once you get it before or exterminate it however you see fit before it goes to seed that is the main um, key because it's not a perennial it won't come back year after year after year um, you just have to catch it before it gets to seed will the slides be on Facebook to review I will post the slides um, on both Facebook as well as on our website yes What are Iowa slash local park rules on picking plants such as herbs or edible plants? Good question. I know that there are rules. So that's one of those things when making a plan before you go explore a natural area, you need to make sure that you're following the rules and guidelines. I believe there are different rules for state versus local um, county parks and services. So just be sure to Google and check those out before you go because that way you won't get in trouble. So I often use iNaturalist to identify plants. Are there any online sites that you recommend? So for this class in intensive purposes, we will be using the field guide. Um, I know that's kind of old school, but my main issue with iNaturalist is sometimes it's wrong or you don't get a good enough picture or you get a picture where it's at a different stage so it thinks it's a different plant. Um, and this is a way for you to see the descriptions um, and be able to directly correlate what you're seeing with a guide that also has some lookalikes with it. On other online things that I would recommend, I don't really know. I also have iNaturalist, but I don't tend to use it very often. So that might be a question for the other botanists that are in this class if they have any online guides that they use. All right, our last question of the day will be, um, can you show a wild parsnip plant? Lucky you. Um, next presentation, Laura Jackson will be going extensively into wild parsnip and lookalikes, so like Golden Alexander. So you will learn all about that plant next time. I really appreciate you all coming out. I know there's a lot more questions coming in. We almost, I believe at one point had over 300 people on the call. Um, so it's really great that you're all able to jump on. As for next time, we will be sending out a registration link on the website as well as directly emailing you and it will be on our Facebook page. So you do have to register again for the upcoming webinar. Um, but we will provide you with that information shortly. Thank you all for attending and I hope this class got off to a great start. I'm really excited to see you all again on Thursday. Have a great night.